It's so good to see you, and it's even better that you can hear me and I can hear you. And today's a very special day because right now, believe not, we are streaming, come on, to our Navin location, our Dundalk location. Come on, Dublin, let's show our appreciation, our love for our church family. One church, three locations. So good to see you guys too and glad that you are here. And as uh, Matthew and Lavinia mentioned, we are starting a brand new series today called Reassembly required a beginner's guide, beginner's guide, not in depth, just you know, just a kind of a skimming through the principles of what it looks like to build healthy relations. Before I jump in to the content, what a great job! Come on, all three locations, show our appreciation for our bands, and our bands are amazing. The work they put in midweek, last week, this week, and I mean, I don't, I don't know if you were here last week at Easter or any of our locations, but last week was the most amazing Sunday. Man, we've had ever. It was incredible. We're so grateful for Easter. But off the back of launching a church, off the back of uh, last week, Easter, we're now talking about like how do we help some people build some things? Because one of the pushbacks people often give us as the church, maybe you're in this room or watching one of our locations, and that's part of what is part of your pushback is that so much of teaching, Christian teaching and preaching, what comes out of churches and from platforms and from pulpits is, is so lofty and so spiritual and so complicated and so theological that it isn't helpful. Like, we, we, we go to church, we listen to great messages, but we leave wondering, what the heck was that about? How does it apply to my life? And how can it help me? And the truth is, that is a great tragedy because God's Word is absolutely jam-packed with practical help. Yes, His Word is a spiritual Word that brings spiritual nourishment to our spirit and our souls, but God's Word is also full of wisdom for life. We say this, that Jesus not only makes our lives better, but Jesus also makes us better at life. And because the one thing we all have in common in this room, besides being in this room or one of our locations, is that we are all connected to other human beings through the, through the bridge, the constru construct, through the connection of relationships. And when we think about the most important things in our lives, the most important things oftentimes aren't really things, are they? They're people. Like, yes, we love our brand new phone and our brand new computer and perhaps the vehicle we drive, the place that we live in. And maybe you're kind of those people who love gadgets. You've got all these gadgets for everything. Like, yes, we, we enjoy our things. And we've got a special place in our heart for our things. But ultimately, the most important part of our lives outside ourselves are the people that we're connected with, the people that we love and the people that we are, are loved by. And the challenge is with that is because so much of our lives is spent with our people, so much of our lives is spent in relationship. There's lots of opportunities, aren't there, for friction, for tension, for offense, for brokenness, for loss, for grief, for brokenheartedness. And what we want to do over the next couple of weeks in this series is we want to give you some practical tools from God's Word. And if you're, not, if you're here or in one of our locations and you're not a Christ follower, even if you don't believe, trust me, these principles from God are helpful anyway. I want to give you these practical tools that will help us to build, whether it's in marriage or friendship or in the workplace or with siblings or on the sports field or in school, help us build healthier relationships. So today in part one, it's called instructions not included. Anyone ever had a baby before? Anyone had ever had two babies, three babies, four babies? Anyone here got more than four babies? I salute you. Four babies, my goodness. It's the most amazing thing because you, you, you as a couple, well, the, the woman, but you as a couple get pregnant and you go on this journey and, and pregnancy is a journey in and of itself. And then you, there's the moment of where the baby's about to be born. That's a whole other journey in and of itself. And then the baby's born and all of a sudden you're holding a human being and it's yours. And even though you've never met this person, you've loved them since the moment you were born. Something in you comes alive in that moment. You as a father will go, man, I just love this child so much. And the nurses do their thing and thank God for nurses and doctors and they cl clean the baby up and get it ready. And, da -da -da. and after like a day or two or three, like when your first baby is like they keep you in for four days, second baby, three days, third baby, two days. The third, fourth baby is like, listen, you, you're, oh, he's born. You can go home now. Like it's like off the birthing stool, out the door kind of thing. And it's almost like all of a sudden here you are in the world with another human being 
that's your child, and you're thinking, where are the instructions? And the truth is, there aren't any. And yes, you can read books, and yes, you can get help, and yes, you can listen to mother-in-laws and grandmothers and mothers and aunties and sisters and all these people that give us advice, and they all have great things to say. But ultimately, there is no instruction manual for parenting for dummies. You kind of have to figure it out as you go along. In the same way, when it comes to our relationships, just relationships in general, just friendships, just having the crack, there's no real instruction manual. Uh, for example, if you're someone who's here, who's been married, are married, or one day hope to get married, there's this wonderful thing when it comes to tension in that particular relationship. Because when you're going out with someone, you're kind of interested in someone, they like you like them, you're going to figure out, hey, what's going on here? It's like when you, when you disagree about something, when you're going out, in the, in the kind of, in the romance phase, it's like, hey, we should go eat sushi. And you're like, yeah, I'm not a massive fan of sushi. Like, I mean, it's not my favorite dish. I mean, like, I'll go if you want to go. But like, like I said, it's not my favorite dish. And they're like, oh, but you don't mind, right? You don't mind if we go to sushi. It's like, well, no, I don't really mind. And you go and you're sitting there, you're smiling to that person you love, trying to show the best side. You're like, I love sushi so much. Blech. Then you get married. And for the first couple of years of marriage, it's like, okay, now do you have them? It's like, okay, now I can be a little bit braver. It's like, you want to go to sushi? Ah, no, not today. I don't want sushi today. Ah, go on. Ah, no. Ah, go on, go on, go on. Ah, no, no. Ah, go on. Listen, I just don't want sushi today. It's like, okay. By year 10, you think it's like, hey, you want to go to sushi? I hate sushi. I've told you a thousand times. Why don't you listen to me? Why aren't you engaging? Why aren't you connected? Why don't you care about my feelings? This is a great advertisement for marriage, by the way. <laughs> and what's really funny is, when you're in the romance phase, or the, the newly married phase, you hear stories that you think, man, I really hope I don't ever get to that place because I don't know how I could survive in a relationship that has to argue and has tension and disagreement. I can't see a way forward. And the truth is that the greatest marriages and the greatest friendships aren't marriages or friendships that are born with no adversity. The greatest relations are the ones that overcome the odds, the stress, the tension, the temptation, the brokenness, the selfishness of life. And despite all the challenges that life throws of two individuals who are bound together in holy matrimony until death do us part, it's, it's actually a story of triumph of overcoming odds. Now again, this is not a series, even though we had a great love song. Being, this isn't a series just about romantic relations or parent relations. It's a series about relationships in general. But the point is, we have these kind of tip, stereotypical conversations as human beings. Here's a typical marital argument. I don't know about you. Maybe you can identify with this quietly. I'll say it publicly. Whenever it comes to myself and me, whenever we have arguments, we're like, almost never. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> daily, momentarily. Uh, you know, here's what happens. She, th she sees things her way. And we all agree that our, our friend, our colleague, our boss, our spouse, our sibling, they're entitled, aren't they? To see things their way. Come on, Navin, Dundalk, yeah. they're entitled. The problem is, is I see things the right way. Like, you're entitled to your opinion. By all means, it's a free country, for goodness sake. Like, have your opinion. But understand, when it comes to this subject matter, in this instance, in this context, when it comes to this conversation, I am right. And you know, for the first couple of years of my marriage, this is how we, we tango. And I get frustrated, think, man, why aren't we making any progress? Like, why aren't we getting over as a couple, progressing, next slide, why aren't we progressing as a couple? Why aren't we going forward? Why aren't we overcoming? Why are we still stuck in the same funk for the last three weeks, three days, three months? And the truth is, it's because in my arrogance, my thinking was, love, if you just see things my way, we can be in our way. Like, we can fix this. Like, we can solve this problem. We can, get, oh, we can get through this. If you just see things my way, then we can be on our way. If they would just, is it true? If they would just see things your way, then what we think oftentimes is everything would be 
Okay. Now, I know exactly the question you're thinking when you're in these kind of conversations. When you're arguing with that person, whether it be an employer, whether it be a co-worker, whether it be a fellow student, a friend, a spouse, a child even, maybe a sibling, what you're thinking as you go through this is, what is wrong with these people? Like, I am being very clear in what I'm saying. I'm being very convincing in how I'm saying it. And I'm very certain of what I'm saying. Therefore, what is wrong with these people? That's exactly the question we're going to try tackle. Now, when it comes to the question, what's wrong with these people, usually the choice uh, of direction we take or the way we, we try to tackle it is I'm going to summarize and call the C4 approach. Now, it's called the C4 approach because there's four C's, but it's also called the C4 approach because just like C4 explosives, when you try to tackle tension relationally in the C4 kind of way, it usually leads to a complete exploding and obliterating and devastating of the relationship that you're in. What are the four C's? C4 is the one. We try to convince people. I'm a great convincer, so I love trying to talk people into something. We try to convict people. We look like, hey, you know, what was your motive in that really? Did you really give your best? Do you really love me? That's the convict. The coercion is like, oh, come on. Like, you know, you'll, you'll enjoy it. Like, you love it. Like, maybe your friend taught you today, come to church with me. Like, you love it. You're thinking, man, what am I doing here? It's like, oh, I don't know if it was motivation or manipulation. It's like, where's the line? Uh, and then there's obviously control, which <laughs> control is obviously the most obvious one because we know when people are trying to get their filthy, sticky paws all over us and control us. And if you're someone that was born in this country, particular, or maybe countries like Ireland, when you feel those sticky fingers of control coming over your life, you're like Jackie Chan. What? It's like, get those hands off me. There's a neighboring country who shall remain unnamed that for 700 years tried to do that. The Irish don't like to be controlled. Get the picture, people. Okay? But the truth is that we, we're not, we're not, we're not malicious. We're not malevolent. We're not evil in how we're trying to relate. We, 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 just, we just do these things oftentimes in a reactory kind of way. But, like, flip it over. How do you respond to these things? Well, we naturally resist, don't we? We naturally resist the C4 approach. So why is then that over and over again, we keep going through this crazy cycle of we try to fix people and convince people and coerce people and control people? Well, because these are tools, and these are oftentimes the tools that we reach. They're, they're low-hanging, low-shelf. They're like the kind of stuff that we learn to use when we we're in play school and baby infants. They're the kind of things we, we learn to use when we're on the, in the schoolyard with our friends. And the problem is they may, and I don't think they did, but they may have worked at that stage in place of life, but they certainly have no application in the real free adult world. Bottom line is, it just doesn't work. And again, if you're here in Dublin or Navin or Dundalk, like, think about it. Like, that, that's why so oftentimes our relationships get into this crazy cycle. It isn't just a cycle that, that runs forward. It's a cycle that kind of runs down. It's like, it's like a spiral. Just our, our friendship, our relationship, our business, partnership, whatever it is. It just downward spirals in to living. And again, we understand this because think about how you feel. Like for you, and the receiving, how do you feel when you're on the receiving end of the C4 approach? Next slide, please. When you're on the receiving end of the C4, uh, C4 approach, when it comes to work, you ask yourself, you, ask, you get it to work in the morning, you go, hey, uh, is the boss in the office today? Or is that coworker, are they coming in? Will they be here? And of course, everyone that works with us knows what we're actually asking. Like, I hope they're not. Because my day will go so much better if they're absent. Or it comes to family. Oh, my mother's coming over. Oh, Grace, okay. And uh, when are they coming? What day? What year? Oh, I think I'm going to be sick for that whole month. It's like, when are they coming? Or another question is, if they're coming, how long are they planning on being here for? Like, we're talking like, is it a tea and coffee kind of gig? Is it more like a dinner? Or God forbid, are they asking to sleep over? And have they spent a whole 24 hours with these people? Or probably the best one is, do we have to go? <laughs> Come on, you know you're guilty. 
do we have to go? I can hear the guilt come to the camera from Navindoc. Do, do we have to go to these events? And the problem is, the longer we try to use these tools to fix something, not only is it not fixed, it gets worse. And the problem is, is nothing gets resolved. And what we do as human beings in order to cope and move forward is we suppress the problem. We suppress the feelings. We suppress the pain, anger, the frustration that we feel in our hearts. And in order to kind of get on with life, we kind of just flippantly uh, abdicate responsibility. And we say things like, well, there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. Like, I, I've tried my best. I tried. Come on. I spoke to them. I went there. I texted them. I sent them a letter in the post. I tried. And eventually, we get to the point where we say, I just don't care anymore. How are things? I just don't care. And the truth is, we know this in truth because relationships are like cars. And even if you don't own a car, have you ever driven a car, you've been in a car, you own a car, it's related to cars. Now, not like this car, although this is a very good car, and this is a great movie to help you with relationships. At the end, when Mike McQueen gives, I won't spoil the end, but when he does something really amazing to help someone else, it's like, man, tears are flowing all over the place. No, no, it's more like this. It's like, why isn't this stupid thing working? Like, there's people in the world who are good at fixing things. You know what I'm saying? They're like, when the lawnmower breaks, they know how to fix it. When the computer won't work, they know how to fix it. When the car, I am not one of those people. When I pay for technology, I expect the thing to work. When the thing doesn't work, I end up, like I am right now, having a conversation with the machine. I'm like, what is your problem, man? Like, what is your issue? Like, what's going on? Like, I'm flipping slap you if you don't start working. Of course, I'm thinking, my neighbors are watching the past next door, slapping the lawnmower, work work and it's like at the end of the day i get a sore hand i feel like an idiot and the lawnmower is not offended because it has no feeling because it's a machine you laugh because you know you see we're better at driving cars than we are at fixing them we, we we're better at getting in and learning how to drive but we're not so good at fixing. And, and the same is true with relations relationships starting a relationship is very intuitive. Like we kind of just know. And again, some people are braver and better because they've practiced their skills. Let me just say something to you. If you're someone that's introverted, please understand that just because you're someone who's more naturally comfortable by yourself, your own company, doesn't mean you can't be good at relationships. And just because someone's extrovert and loud doesn't mean they're good at building relationships. It means they're good at being loud. So there's something about us, you means we all have the intuitive ability to build relationships. It's just something that comes natural. But fixing relationships is something we all suck at. It's not easy. It's not obvious. It's not clear. And oftentimes, it's very sad for me as a pastor because people's marriages, our relationship with their parents, our siblings, or just in general, or even the church Christians, like so many relationships are lost purely because people who are, who are naturally good at driving and living and doing are, are, are lack the skills of a relational mechanic and don't have the tools to restore that, that person, that relationship with men. That's part of the reason why we're doing this series, because in this series, we will learn next few weeks the decisions that pave the way for hell. Come on, isn't that what we want? I mean, if you're here or in a dock or nav and you're not even a Christ follower and you're just curious, I mean, that's what we all, what we all want. Whatever relationship we're in, whether it's work or school or a sports team, whether it's a connect group or it's a marriage, what we want deep, deep down is we want healthy, mutually beneficial relationships. But here's what I want you to know. Reassembling broken relations, even though it isn't, it isn't intuitive, it is a learned skill. We can all, as we go on this journey of the next couple weeks, we can all get better in the skill of reassembling relationships that are broken, are unhealthy. And the bonus bit of information for us today is that because we're in church and because we're going to look, look at God's Word in just a second, we also know that God's help is available to us. And here's the thing that we need to know about God. God is in the reassembly business. It's, it's a speciality. Reassembling broken people, reassembling broken relations is God's speciality. So if you're here again or in Navin or in Dock and you're not a Christ or not a Christian, that's from a faith, understand this. 
for when it comes to reassembling broken relationships, there is help available. I want you to know there is help available for you. You don't have to do it alone. There is help in this room. There's help in our Navin location, in our location. There's help from heaven for you in your brokenness, but also there is hope. And I want us to approach the next few weeks with this sense of even though things are difficult, and even though things have caused us pain, even though things have hurt us, even though people have hurt us, there is help and there is hope. And where do we go for us help and hope when we turn to God's Word? If you have a Bible or a Bible app, you can open now to the book of Philippians. We're going to look at chapter 5, chapter 2, sorry, verses 1 to 5. And again, if you have the Bible up by you version, all of today's notes are there for you to track along. So in the New Testament, the book of Philippians, chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 to 5. And this is the Apostle Paul. He's writing to a church like this in a city called Philippi. And he's encouraging them because there's, you know, like most of Paul, if you read the, what's called the Pauline epistles, the letters of St. Paul, a lot of them are him dealing with relational issues in the various churches. So there's issues in the church of Corinth, so the letter of Corinthians. There's issues in the church of Ephesus, which is a city in Turkey, so the letter to the Ephesians. There's issues in the church in Colossae, another city, so the letter to the Colossians, and so on and so forth. What's really interesting about the book of Philippians is the book of Philippians is the only book where Paul really doesn't have anything to deal with because it seems like they're doing things right. And so what it tells us is even if things are going well for you relationally at every level, there is still help and hope for you because there might come a day, my friend, when things don't go so well. And so in this season of things working, Paul encouraged them with these words. He says, if you have any encouragement of being united with Christ, again, he's speaking primarily to those who are followers of Jesus, Christians, followers of Jesus. And he said, hey, if you're encouraged by your relationship with Jesus, which we all go, yes, amen, I am. I'm, I'm very happy, I'm delighted, I'm blessed to know God and be in relationship with him. If any comfort in his love, absolutely. If any common sharing in the Spirit, one, I mean, if it wasn't for the Spirit of God, where would we be? If any tenderness and compassion... And we all go, yep, God's made my heart more tender. God's been more compassionate. As I see the world through his eyes, as I feel the world through his heart, as his word continues to shape me into the image and likeness of Christ, I see the world not as it is. I see the world not as I see. I see the world as God sees it. Yes, 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 yes. And here's the application, verse 2. Then make my joy complete, he says, by being like-minded. Now, when we see that, we think, is he talking about us? Being like-minded in Dublin and Dock and Navin? Well, we're going to see in a second. Having the same love, us having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind, well, we're going to see in verse 3, he goes on to say, do nothing out of selfish ambition. And again, this is what really, I mean, just for a second, this is what really ultimately destroys every relationship. The untold, unconfessed, dirty, sinful truth is that we want something at the expense of what the other person wants or needs. If we could just apply that one line, that I'm going to do nothing out of selfish ambition, I'm not discounting that there are relationships that are completely toxic and unhealthy and unhelpful and perhaps even dangerous. And there are times, listen carefully to me as your pastor, all three locations, where what you need to do in that relationship is run for your life. Eject, eject, eject. If you can't eject them, eject yourself and get the heck out of there. Because it does not glorify God for you to be abused as a person. Emotionally, physically, or spiritually. And I'm not just talking about the women. There are also men that oftentimes are on the receiving end of those kinds of levels of toxicity. There is a place and time for you to go eject, eject, eject. And if you're, a, if you're a person in a sensitive moment or place, I understand you can come and talk to myself, Pastor Sam and Navin, Pastor Rebecca uh, in the dock, and we will help you and support you and counsel you in, in a private and sensitive manner because there is nothing good about you suffering like that at the hands of someone who clearly needs help. With me? But for the other 
90, whatever it is, 5, 7, 8, 9% people, you know, a lot of times what could fix, what the quick fix to our scenario is give up wanting what you want at the expense of the other person. I'm not saying stop feeling, stop wanting. I'm saying just learn to compromise against the sermon from the other day. So Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, what's the term? In humility. Now again, we often think humility is putting myself down. Listen to me. Humility is not about putting yourself down. Oftentimes, that kind of humility is actually a false humility. For example, if someone were to come to me after service and say, hey, I really enjoyed your message. Thank you. I'm not going to go, well, you know, it wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit. It's like, yes, understand that what I'm doing right now is fueled by, if you ask me, how do I, it's like by the power of God. I mean, it's by God's power that I can do these things. But I was the one who prepared the message. I was the one who typed the notes. I was the one who made these beautiful slides for all of you. I'm the one standing here sweating, preaching my heart and guts and lungs out. So you know what? Thank you. Thank you for your compliments. That does not make me arrogant. I'm not saying I'm glad you noticed my superior preaching ability. Like, I'm amazing. I've got 10 followers on YouTube. Hello. Like, I don't promote myself. Like, hey, come here. It's amazing pastor. They're like, sorry, people. Thank God I was born in Ireland. We have a natural just reflux, like kind of nonsense, you know? Here comes the most reverent, holy bishop, apostle, anointed, fire of God, man of God, straight from heaven, God, almost better than Jesus, Pastor Jamie. It's like, what? Listen, I'm just a dude with long hair and a beard who loves God and loves this place and loves you, all of you, Navin, Dundalk. And I'm doing my best to follow Jesus. I'm doing my best to help you follow because I believe that our life is not only better, but we, there's something about attaining and experiencing and walking in our full potential, our calling, our des- destiny, our extraordinary purpose when we're following Jesus. And I want that for you, but I am not the standard Jesus is. So there's this dance we do where humility isn't putting myself down. So what is humility? Humility is lifting others up. And, and if, if I put myself down and lift others up, I haven't really lifted them up very far, have I? Like if I put you on my shoulders right now, you're going to be much higher. But if I get in my knees put you on my shoulders, you're going to be much lower. So me being confident in who I am and what I'm doing and what God has put in my life and then lifting you up means you really are lifted up. It's like, for example, when, when a stranger compliments you, it's a nice thing. It's a nice thing, guys. Like, hey, hey, you look great today. Nice thing. I'm not a stranger, by the way. When someone who means something to you says, hey, I think you look great. It's like, wow, thank you. I feel so... What's the, it's the same compliment because that person because of their value in your eyes because they're so high when they speak of you and to you you're higher it's like again you, i don't know how you whatever your opinion is on the last week and president biden being in ireland and of course being in dock i mean some crack come on <laughs> you know it's like but he's, he's still the president of the most powerful nation world so when he says something in a deli or to locals in mayo and says mayo for sam it's like it carries so much more weight it isn't, it isn't that he's been arrogant, he's secure in who he is, it's that he's actually lifting other people up. So humility isn't putting myself down, it's valuing others above ourselves. Not looking to your own interests as he continues, but each of you to the interests of others. Here's the bottom line, verse 5. Here's, here really, this really is the kind of base verse, the base thought, the foundation for the next couple of weeks. Your attitude your mindset, in your relationships, in your life with one another, be the same as Jesus. Have the same mindset in all your relationships, one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. The apostle saying this, this is a paraphrased version. In all your relationships, I want you to approach them in the way your Father in heaven demonstrated to us 
in sending his son, Jesus. Now understand, what we're, what we're propagating here is that this approach, this Jesus-like, Jesus-inspired, Jesus-modeled approach is helpful. And if you're sitting there going, well, I'm not sure I want to embrace that. I'm not convinced. Maybe you're here as a Christ follower or perhaps in Navin or Dock, a Christ follower, and you're thinking, I, I don't know if I want to follow Jesus. Well, what's the alternative? Well, in my opinion, the alternative is hell. I don't mean you're going to go to hell. I mean you're going to make your life hell and those you love. Because what do we revert to? If we don't have a standard, if we don't have an example, if we don't, if we don't look to Jesus for help, what do we revert to? The C4 approach. We go back to plastic explosives. It's like life was so much easier when I could just blow things up. I mean, it, it, mean, it hurt me to see my, my friend, my colleague, my wife, my husband suffer. But like being an emotional terrorist is a lot of fun sometimes, right? I don't know about Navin the dog, but it's very quiet in Dublin all of a sudden. Is that tumbleweed? It's like if we're really, really pouring our goods out right now, it's like, actually, sometimes I, I like to win arguments. I like to overpower people. I like to get my way. And again, we don't like admitting that, but that's the truth. Because something in us is not right. <laughs> it's broken. And so if we don't look to the example of Jesus, we revert to convincing people, convicting people, coercing people. And controlling people. And again, I'm not saying we do this maliciously or malevolently. We're not always aware that we're using them, but we are. And again, what, how, do, how do I know I'm using them? Well, oftentimes, as we often say in church because it comes from God's word, our mouth reveals where our heart is. Oftentimes, what we say in those moments is the giveaway to what's really going on in our heart. For example, <clears throat> here's a controlling statement. We're in a, an argument, and we're trying to get the other person to see that we're right and they're wrong, but they won't. And then we say some things that are mean and hurtful. And then time goes by and we come back and we try to reconcile. And we say, I'm sorry if I offended you. And again, is this every politician, every person says something stupid on Twitter? It's like, oh, 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 I didn't, I didn't realize. I mean, I'm so sorry if I offended you. Now, why is that controlling? Because translate what it's, what's actually being said is, Man, you're so soft. You're so easily offended. Like, I cannot believe I'm having to apologize to you for this. And again, because we're so good at being bad, it doesn't end there. Oftentimes, we go for the nuclear option, right? Because we get worked up, and we're emotional, and we're, we're, we're not happy. It's like, okay, I'm going to press the red button. So what's the nuclear option in this regard? Well, what I said wouldn't have offended a mature, emotionally stable adult. It's like I can hear the explosion from like 10 miles. Of, there goes that marriage. Here's another one we do. Here's another controlling statement. We say, I said I'm sorry. Why are you still upset? Like I did my bit. I said my thing. Like, what, what, why are we still dealing with this? Translation, please. I've done my part. You should be fine now. Like, yes, I said horrible, wounding, difficult, mean things. But I said, sorry. You should be fixed. What's your issue? And again, because we're so good at being bad, we don't stop there, do we, people? We go nuclear. What's the nuclear version of this statement? Since you're not fine, and I am, clearly something is wrong with you. Because I'm fine. But you're clearly the issue. One more. This is my favorite one. You need to get over it. I have. What? You're still, you're still there? You're still, you're still bringing up that? Like, come on. That happened like six minutes ago. Like, seriously, I am so over. Translation, can you just grow up already? This is great. This is a great alternative, isn't it? Not following Jesus. Again, what does the alter what's the nuclear option there? <laughs> From my superior morally intelligent position, you look like an Egypt. You pitiful, childish human being, you. Why can't you come to my level of superiority and float with me on the clouds of what it means to be a model citizen? 
And of course, that works every time, right? Wrong. And we know when we do it, and we hate when it's done to us, and we've been in or seen or experienced or come from a broken family, a broken home, or seen friends' marriages capitulate, or friendships be torn apart because people in their hurt, in their, in their confusion, in their frustration, try to get back at people, press the nuclear button, and all of a sudden, what sometimes was a really stupid, we look back in hindsight, not disrespect the moment, and it was a really stupid issue, costs us a relationship. And again, I'm not here to condemn or judge. I'm with you. I'm speaking as chief of sinners, let me tell you. The wife was here, she could do the whole sermon just talking about the stuff I do wrong. Where I think all this great content comes from. Come on, somebody. It's like, I like the nuclear option. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. What's the problem? The problem is we're good at blowing things up. We're not so good at fixing things. Fixing broken relationships is not intuitive. Defending ourselves fighting back and throwing verbal bombs at each other is something we're actually very scarily naturally good at. But rebuilding, reconciling, restoring are not things that we're good at. We, we, and when we find ourselves tested and tempted, when we don't choose what we believe is a helpful way, the way to follow Jesus, we reach for the wrong tools. And all they are is their tools, their approaches. We say the wrong things and we end up in the wrong, we wake up in the morning and go, how did I get here? How has my life become this? How am I in this place? How has my marriage become <clears throat> passionless and, and, and maybe even sexless? And to the point where we don't even talk to each other. How is, my, how is my best friend from, how are we so cold? And so? Is, why are things so difficult? It's like we wake up and go, how did I get here? And the, tr and the truth is, we got here because we made choices and used tools that weren't helpful. And eventually we get to this place of like relation limbo where one of the three things happens. Number one, we're waiting. We're kind of waiting for them. Oh, when they wake up, they'll come and say sorry. And I'll give them a piece of my mind. And they ain't coming. Or we fall into the rehearsing category. We keep rehearsing in our mind. When I talk to them, I'm going to say, I'll ask me this and point that. And in my, in my mind, I'm like, a, I'm, like a, I'm like a relation like superhero ninja. Like, yeah, boom, like you throw at me, no accusation, boom, I'm right, you see, and I win. Or we're just avoiding for the rest of our lives, which is possible if there are someone not very close, but if it's your mother-in-law, she knows you're a voyeur, she will find you. If it's your two-year-old toddler, he will find you too. He knows. These aren't helpful strategies for life, and they certainly aren't conducive to building healthy relationships. The question then is, I'm going to turn a corner, we're going to get to the end of this in a second. What is the goal then? As we set up this series, we think about this is the truth, this is where we are, we know we can identify, we let these things. What is the goal? Well, here's, here's a little bit of a, of a shocking idea. The goal isn't reconciliation. We're talking about reconciling and restoring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the goal isn't reconciliation. Why? Here's a little, little tip. This is a good tip for you if you want to be healthy and happy and one day if you're married. Never set a goal for another adult. Set goals for yourself, but never impose your preferred objective on other people. Why? Because a goal is an agenda. And when we feel someone's agenda controlling, coercing, convicting, and convincing us, we feel undermined. And what do you do when you're in a relationship that continually and constantly, verbally, emotionally, physically, spiritually undermines you? Eventually that relationship will break. And yeah, on paper, they may be your wife, and yeah, on Instagram, they may follow you. Yeah, they may be your sibling, but in their heart, they have died to you. So we can't, we can't make, we can't control the other person. We can't, to make reconciliation the goal would mean that we have the power to control, converse. That's why we, 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 try, we try in our reconciling to push the person back into health. And you can't force someone, now in the doctor, back into health. You have to love them just the way they are. So again, I ask, so what is the goal? Well, the goal for this series, 
and the goal for reassembling and rebuilding healthy relationships is that we would live with no regrets. That we could say, yes, I wronged. Yes, I said. Yes, I did. Yes, I didn't do. Yes, I didn't say. But I accept responsibility. I'm genuinely repentant. And I'm going to do everything in my power, on my side. I'm going to set my own personal agenda to live in a way that I've said and done and everything I do. So I have no way so that maybe reconciliation is possible. Now, I'm not, don't, don't hear I'm not saying. I'm not saying reconciliation isn't important. Then the reconciliation is the operative noun of the Christian faith. Meaning, one, one of the ways you can describe Christians and how we operate, are we, are, we are the redeemed. We are the rescued. We are the reconciled. We are the restored. We are those that were dead and now live. We are those who are far and now belong. We are those who are orphans and now sons. We, that's who we are as Jesus follows. Reconciliation is everything. And, and, and essentially, at its heart, the word reconciliation means restoration. And God, God's plan and purpose for the world, when you read this book from cover to cover, is God's heart is to restore the world. Which is really interesting because if you're here or in Navin or in the dock, and you would say, I'm not really a Christ follower. Listen carefully. Still, when it comes to the world, your, 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 your desire is that the world be restored. You think, well, what do you mean? Well, climate, poverty, injustice, inequality. Why do we fight for it? Because something in us wants what God wants, and that is the restoration of the entire world. Now, God's word shows the plan for how, how it happened. It can only be possible in the person of Jesus. Reconciliation is everything. To which you go, well, what about forgiveness? Well, again, forgiveness is a huge part of the reconciliation equation, but it's only half of the equation. And what happens oftentimes in churches, because it's practical and simple, we can get our heads around forgiveness, is we make it all about forgiveness, but it's not all about forgiveness. Why? Because, listen carefully, I can forgive someone and not reconcile with them. I can forgive you at arm's length, but not embrace your reconciliation. I can choose to let go of you and to live freely now having got over and dealt with and processed the things you've done, but forgiving someone is not the same as reconciling with someone. And again, we have to remember hot off the heels of Easter, come on Dublin Avenue and the dock, is that God was not content in just forgiving us. God desired to reconcile us to himself in relationship. Yeah, God could have said, listen, humankind, you've sinned against me. I've chosen your own path. You've chosen your own gods. But you know what? I've got, I've been to, I went to a counselor, a great counselor, named Gabriel, and uh, he was great. Sat with him, expressed my feelings, my frustrations, these children who run away from me and don't love me, don't appreciate me, and keep hurting each other. But you know what? I've forgiven you. So let's look. And we're still here. Where's the help? Where's the hope? Where's the Father? But God, God's heart was that we could be in relationship with him. That we could, as sons and daughters, sit at his table and know despite who we are, what we've done, where we've come from, this place belongs to me. When my kids sit at the dinner table, they could, may have been bold that day, they may have been cheeky, they may have fallen down and got hurt, they may have lied to me. When they sit at that table, that is their place. They belong there because they're my children. We can live every day with a perpetual sense of knowing who we are and whose we are. We receive the reconciliation of God. Reconciliation may not be our goal, but it is the win. It is what we're hoping for, which is why Paul, we conclude, back to verse 5, says, In your relation with one another, have the same mindset. What is the mindset? Let's not choose the C4 approach. Let's cho choose the Jesus approach. And in the coming weeks, we're going to unpack this more and more. But part of it is understanding that even though we want restoration, we can't control the other person. We've got to do what's on our side of the tennis court. We, have to, we take care of our business and hope that the other person will reciprocate. The bottom line is, this is how we follow Jesus. This is what it means to be a Jesus follower. And again, if you're here or in the dock or in Avon and you're not a Jesus follower, listen, these things are optional. Don't feel obliged. Don't feel pressure. Don't feel control or coercion or, or 
or conviction or anything for me. These are optional. And they're resourceful because I really believe these things will help you like now. You put them into action now. They will help you. But listen carefully. Lean right in. If you're a Jesus follower, listen to me carefully. If you're, this Lyle Church is your home and you're a Jesus follower, all three locations, listen carefully. This is not optional. And this is required. Because this is what a Jesus follower is. We are Jesus followers because we follow Jesus. So what did Jesus do that's worthy of our following? Well, God forgave us. And again, God's forgiveness is great, but God's forgiveness was a means to end. What end? God's forgiveness removed the obstacle in our relationship. Which, what was the obstacle? Sin. On Good Friday, we remember that Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God, voluntarily gave up his life to die in our place so you and I and us, we could be forgiven. And in that forgiveness, that we could be wrecked out of God. Why? Because the win at the end is a reassembled relationship with your Father in heaven. The goal of this series is to follow Jesus when it comes to healthy relationships to have no regrets. My question is, we pray, I'm going to invite the band to come in Dublin, the band in Dock, and the band in Navin. question is, what is stopping you from trying? Yes, you may not be able to try. Maybe, maybe you can't control the other person. That's on them. But what's stopping you from trying? And let me go even push a little bit harder. What's stopping you from trying really? Because oftentimes, you go, oh, something trying. Well, the other, their, their junk, their issue, their thing, their whatever. But really, it's actually in us. And oftentimes, it's on us. What would stop at least trying? What would stop you from sending that text message today and saying, hey, listen, will you talk? Or hey, I, I want to say I love you. Or hey, haven't spoken in ages, love to grab a coffee. Pick up the phone and ring that person. Go to that neighbor. What's, what's really stopping you from trying? I want you to know that reassembling broken relationships is God's speciality. Our next weeks, I want us to see that as we take God's words, we trust God's words, we take bold and brave steps towards health, out of humility, and in love. There is help, and there is hope for you. God sees you. God loves you. And if you're here or in the dock in Navin, you've never opened your heart to God and experienced the power of that restoration for yourself. Maybe today, the number one and most important decision you can make is that God, I, before I reconcile others to myself, I want to experience the reconciliation of the gospel. Knowing you and being known by you. Knowing your love. The power of your presence. Maybe you'd have a good father. You don't know what evil, what evil one looks like. Maybe today, it's a day where you, for the first time, know the loving, affirming, forgiving, restoring, rescuing, and reconciling embrace of your Father in heaven who loves you. Mm -hmm.